order here at uh, 10 o'clock and we'll, we uh, will uh, save our introductions until the Zoom portion of the meeting so we don't have to go through them twice. And I uh, will start with the adoption of the agenda. Are there any additions? Uh, Mr. Nyberg. Mr. Chairman, I will, uh, uh, if there are no additions, adopt the agenda as presented. I just have the Ag Plastics uh, Recycling Group uh, just an oral presentation from that meeting. Okay, we'll put that at 11.2, the oral presentation. Okay, um, Mr. Gender? I'd just like to, we sent a letter to for the red tape reduction last month. I'm just wondering if there's been any follow up on it for the gravel pit reclamations. Okay, let's see old business. Uh, that could come in um, more this is arising from the minutes, I think. Okay, we'll put that under 6.1 then. Any other additions to the agenda? If not, Mr. Nyberg has a motion to adopt. It says with the additions, all in favor? Carried. Adoption of the minutes from the April 28th meeting. They have been dis distributed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Has, has moved the minutes. All those in favor? And carried. Oh, um, Sheree, you are muted, but uh, I see your hand. <laughs> okay, there we go. Okay. Um, if Michael Hardy is ready for his presentation, we'll move to that via Zoom. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Michael. Um, um, for your benefit, we're going to go through introductions to, so you know who you're uh, speaking with today. And um, I, I'll start. I am Les Stuhlberg. I'm vice chair for the ASB committee. Our chair, Dave Grover, is absent today and one of our members Sheree Neitz is joining us by Zoom as well and uh, I will now start with the members of our board and I'll start with the members to my right if you would. James Harbour, um, ASB member. Wayne Nixon, board member. Ernie Gender, board member. Quentin Mullock, manager of agriculture services. Andrew Ruchek, Director of Municipal Services. Rick Green, Director of Operations. Nick Cassidy, CAO. Great. Yeah. And Sheree. Yeah, and Sheree needs to join us via Zoom. So, um, Michael, feel free to go ahead with your presentation. Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate the invitation. Um, I'm going to try to share my screen here. Perfect. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, yes, we can. Sorry, we're muted. Oops. Sorry, we were muted, but yes, we can see it. Thank you. Oh, excellent. Okay. So, uh, my name's Mike Harding. I'm a crop assurance lead with Alberta Ag and Forestry. And um, Quentin asked me if I would uh, talk a little bit about some of the crop diseases that might be of concern in 2021. And I'm going to go through, I've got about 20 slides. I'm going to go through them pretty quick. So, I'm thinking maybe 10 minutes ish. Because uh, I know you got a busy agenda, and then, but if there's questions, we can certainly talk about them. So I'm going to talk just quickly about some disease trends that we've seen in the past. Uh, I'm going to talk about some things that we could watch for, uh, which there's common disease issues that I think we need to be aware of and watching for all the time and continuing to to battle. But there's also new and emerging issues that I'll uh, discuss as well. And so I think off the top, I'll just quickly say, why, why do we do this? Why, why are we interested in crop assurance? So the first is that uh, we support the, the Agricultural Pest Act in Alberta. And so we were always interested in 
limiting the introduction or spread of agricultural pests that are going to be problematic. But the second reason we do this is more proactive rather than um, just sort of legislated um, enforcement. We, for example, the surveys that Quentin helps us with have fed information into our chief provincial plant health officer and to the CFIA to help resolve trade disputes with um, countries like China that don't want to accept our canola because of supposed pests. So the information that's collected through our network, um, including uh, the Ag Fieldmen, is really important for sometimes resolving some of these disputes that are pest related. So off the top, I want to thank Quentin for all his help and support and the Ag Fieldmen really um, are a huge part of our survey network. So thank you. Okay, so uh, let's talk about some canola disease trends. I've got um, club root here on the, I'm going to just activate my laser pointer here to make it a little easier. Uh, this is the canola, club root in canola prevalence. So the percent of fields that have club root in them from 2015 to 2020, you can see that when we do surveys, we usually find about 10% of the fields that have club root in them. Now let's look at the sclerotinia line here, the green one. This is much more responsive to weather patterns. So if we get a wet July or a lot of moisture early in August, sclerotinia can be a much bigger issue than in the years where we're dry. So this fluctuates a lot depending on the weather. And because we don't have any really strong resistant genetics for sclerotinia, the weather is the primary driver. And then the pink line here, or the red line is black leg. And one of the things we can see here is that the prevalence or the percent of fields that we find with black leg has been decreasing. There's a number of things we could speculate as to why this is. Uh, I think weather also plays a part to some extent. I think our resistant genetics are solid and are, are holding. And I'm also hopeful that increases in um, crop rotation or the number of years between canola crops has also helped us bring this number down. But anyway, that's a bit of a good news story. So before we start thinking that club root is a flat line, like I said, in our surveys, we usually find about 10% of county uh, fields positive. I wanna just let you know that last year there were three new counties um, reporting club root for the first time, two in the Peace region and one uh, was Wheatland County. So it does continue to spread to new areas. In addition to that, the cumulative number of fields that are reported with club root continues to go up. So club root isn't a flat line. It's still increasing and it's still spreading. It's still something we need to be aware of and, and really vigilant about trying to prevent. Okay, the second thing I want to mention is that the um, part of the uh, black leg survey that we do in canola um, is uh, assisted by the Ag Fieldman. So some of the information in this map would have been provided by Quentin's group. And this is where we take the number of uh, fields that have higher than average severity of black leg. And then using geographic information systems and um, computer analysis, we have the each spot reach out and look at the spots around it to see if there's a hot spot, so to speak. And this doesn't mean a catastrophic black leg level. It just means are there spots in the province where we have a little higher black leg severity? And you can see that the color of the spots um, for each of these years of the survey. And I just wanted to point out that you know, you guys are kind of on the fringe of where we're finding these hot spots. And so black leg isn't something that we should just assume is never going to be an issue in any fields in, in Stetler County. So again, we have a good handle and we're able to manage black leg pretty effectively, but we shouldn't think that it could never sort of pop up at a, a significant level in a field or in an area around Stetler. Okay, jumping from canola into wheat diseases, I'm showing you here the Canadian Grain Commission's percent of samples with fusarium damaged kernels from 2003 up to 2020. And so in Alberta, these are the results just for Alberta. 
And you can see that, you know, we had pretty low levels of FHB up until about 2010. Then the situation started changing. And then we've kind of had this up and down trend based on weather. So again, Fusarium head blight is one of those diseases that's very driven by weather. And I wanted to just point out that um, this tells a bit of the story, but the, the Green Commission also divides its data up by crop um, uh, zone. So we've got seven crop areas in Alberta, according to the Canadian Grain Commission. And I'm going to just show you the results for each of these crop districts. Now this graph gets a little busy, but I'm going to just point out the thing that I want you to look at. Look at here in, you know, this peak here in 2012, 13, and then this other peak here in 2016. This was a very wet summer. You can see that these the colors of the lines up on top here are these crop districts one, two, three, and four. Okay, so the this area of the province was showing high levels of uh, Fusarium germiniarum in the samples, and then crop districts six and seven were were low. Look at the situation in 2018 to 2020. It's totally reversed. So now we've got low levels in the south because it's been relatively dry and we have higher levels in you know, areas outside of irrigated southern Alberta. So the take home message from this is that we can't assume that Fusarium germiniarum is just a southern Alberta problem anymore. The situation has really changed over the last three years and, and it's now becoming, if it has not already become an issue that every cereal grower in Alberta needs to be on the lookout for and be ready to manage. So again, the Fusarium head blight survey data that the province does, I'm showing you the data from the Grain Commission, but the surveys that the province does, uh, we do them once about every five years, and the ag field men have helped with that. And, and that information helped significantly in policy direction and decisions made by the ag minister surrounding Fusarium head blight. So again, this information isn't just for enforcement, but it's also for um, informing policy. So we'll jump down to peas. I'm showing you Michael, three diseases. Uh, we, uh, can uh, you take a question now? For sure, absolutely. Okay, we have a board member, Wayne Nixon, with a question. Yes, now that Fusarium has been taken from the Pest Act, is that going to be a problem? Because before we must look after it, now we may. Um, I, I'd say probably yes and no, and very situationally. Uh, if that decision to deregulate led um, individuals to believe that it's no longer an issue, that's a problem. If the deregulation led producers to believe, okay, you know, now I don't, I don't have to think about regulation anymore. I can just manage the issue. I can avoid it. I can contain it, manage it. Then that's fine. So um, I think, though, we have kind of reached a if we haven't reached a tipping point yet, we're very close to uh, this pathogen becoming common in enough areas of the province that um, there, there's plenty of regions of the province where we can no longer avoid it. And, and this this graph that I'm showing you confirms some of that. That even in you know northern central and northern Alberta, there's plenty of examples of. Um, Fusarium damage kernels and Fusarium germiniarum. So um, I, I'd say the answer is maybe, and it depends on how people receive that information. Does it mean that I don't have to worry about Fusarium germiniarum anymore? Well, that's a problem if somebody believes that. But if we just believe now we can work together and not fight about regulations or policy and just get on with managing the disease, then I think we're going to win. Does that answer the question? Yes, thank you. Okay, it's, it's an excellent question. Um, and yes, feel free to jump in and ask anything at any time. So uh, P diseases, I've got three on the chart here. I'm showing some trends. This red line is root rot, and you can see the number of, the percent of fields with root rot is usually between 90% and 100%. That doesn't mean every pea plant has root rot. It just means that we can find it in over 90% of the fields. Sometimes it's in small patches. This black line is Mycosporella or Ascochyta, and it's the second most commonly occurring pea disease in Alberta. 
And then we also have been tracking bacterial blight. And this is, again, um, there's a few reasons why this may flare up here or there, uh, but we're just kind of keeping an eye on it. I don't think this is a major issue, but um, I, I thought I'd just put it on the slide just in case people were interested. Really, really the two P diseases we have to combat, combat are uh, mycosporella blight and uh, root rot. Okay, so I've taken you through some trends. Uh, now, um, Quentin asked me if I would just talk about some things maybe we need to watch for and just show you some examples of uh, diseases in crops so that you can maybe have a little better, better eye for, for what to look for. And, and so I thought I'd start by just saying, you know, if you're driving past a canola field and you see this spot, a premature ripening, maybe some lodging, um, well, what is that? So the first thing is um, you got to get to the bottom of what's going on there. You can't diagnose that based on the above ground symptoms. Now, it's important to recognize when something isn't right. Uh, so that oftentimes means a disease, either a biotic or an abiotic condition that's causing a problem. But you need to investigate it and don't jump to conclusions. So, for example, if you saw this patch in a canola field and you thought, oh, you know, that field always has a lot of sclerotinia. It's probably just stem rot. Well, maybe it is, but maybe it's club root. Maybe it's stem rot or maybe it's black lake. So it's, it's good to get in there and get to the bottom of what's going on and to remember that it could be more than one thing. You could have stem rot, but you could also have club root. You won't know that unless you pull up some roots and look. Uh, now, I wanted to also just say, sometimes you might need help getting a diagnosis. And so that's where my group um, can help out. And, and sometimes, you know, if Quinton has a sample that he needs help with, the Alberta Plant Health Lab is there to be a backstop for diagnostics. And so that that's, we, we've got the help there when we need uh, testing. And keeping records is critical so that we can have some memory of, of what it is that's going on in our fields. We have another question for you, Mike, from um, Mr. Nyberg. So, yeah. Michael, with the club root, and you showed your trend there of, it's basically 17 years, I'm looking at 17, 18 years. Have, have we, do we go back and retest these fields? So if we see it, uh, a, um, or we discover a, a field that has club root in it, and then we put it on the watch list and we tell them they can't grow for how many years? Four years. Have we in that records that you're keeping there, are there records of a field that has been cleaned up or are all these fields continuing to be a problem source? So after four years, Farmer Joe, oh, bad one, Farmer Sam puts in a, um, a, um, another crop of canola. Do we follow up or do you guys follow up or how does that work? How do we know these do we ever know they get clean? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, so at the level that I work, um, we don't we don't keep records of uh, detailed inspections that are done uh, in each county individually. So the inspections that Quentin does, um, that information may feed into our general survey depending on whether the protocol or survey protocol was used. But our survey protocol is a little bit more of a 30,000 foot view. Um, the kind of thing that you're asking about is, you know, following a field from its first report of club root, you know, through the, you know, the years of, did, did the problem go away? Did it stay the same? Did it get better? Did it get worse? Um, we don't, um, my group doesn't track that. So, so, so we're just looking at a standard number of fields, but there are counties that have looked at those kinds of things. And in general, when the, you know, when the restrictions or, or regulations are followed, what they see is that the, the percent incidence of clubbered in that field remains low. So Michael, and, and going back to that graph where you showed the cumulative amount of fields, unfortunately, I do find that a little bit disingenuous. If we have from 2003, 50% of the fields that we found in 2003 are cleaned up and are, have no um, 
um, look of club root in them, it's a little disingenuous to say in 2020 that we have 4,000 4, fields of club root. Um, I'm not so sure I, I see that as a, a good news story or is it just club roots bad and we got to do, you know, we got 4,000 fields that are bad out there. Well, in actuality, we might have 700 fields in 2020 that are bad and 3,000 that are cleaned up. We've done our job. What it looks to me and with this graph, if I was a, a layman out there, boy, you guys haven't fixed anything. And I think we have. I think what our program has actually done some good. Sure, yeah, that's point well taken. I appreciate that comment. Um, th this, uh, again, the, the provincial survey that we do doesn't uh, really have the ability to track, uh, uh, I guess, sort of a cleanup, like what you're talking about. Um, because the club roots forest survived for so long uh, in the soil, um, you know, getting rid of club root probably isn't an option, but successfully managing it is. And I think you're right. I think there's a lot of good news stories out there where, you know, when when the mandatory rotation and use the the, the uh, um, careful use of resistant genetics is it deployed, uh, we can certainly manage this issue. And, and, and I totally agree with what you're saying. Um, the the results to here that I'm showing for this survey can't pull out that kind of granular information at the municipal level where you've had success at either keeping club root uh, incidents or spore loads very, very low. Um, so so fair, I, fair I, enough. I just, that's the point, point that's point, well Just the point of, of it looks like we're not doing anything with it. And there's a number of naysayers out there that, and I'm, I'm of the opinion that it, good farmers will take care of themselves and sometimes we are doing a lot of work for farmers who don't and sorry this language but don't give a shit and we end up doing a lot of work for those particular farmers um the good farmers are yeah it, and it's always that way it doesn't matter what you're dealing with so. yeah excellent point thank you so the, the last thing I wanted to talk about here on the canola side was um, there's a new kid on the block, um, and, and I'm assuming some of you or most of you maybe even heard of this. This is verticillium stripe. Uh, in, in Europe, it's called verticillium wilt. It's caused by a fungus that's name is verticillium. And I'm showing you some symptoms here. So here are some stems where you can see the epidermis kind of shredding and when you look under this epidermis that's falling off, you see these little black spots. These are called microsclerotia. So just like the sclerotinia fungus can produce sclerotia that will survive in the soil for three to five years, this fungus also produces a tiny little um, melanized structure that will survive in the soil for you know, five plus years. Um, sometimes the symptoms look a lot like black light. So here's a canola stem cross section that's pretty clean. Here's one that's got black leg, and this is a stem that has verticillium. Um, so it, it's probably flying under the radar a bit, so to speak. We have not detected this yet in our canola surveys in Alberta. That does not mean it's not here, uh, but it's, if it is here, it's at low enough levels that, that we're not picking it up in our surveys. But it's definitely something to be on the lookout for. Um, as we go forward, it's a much bigger issue in Manitoba where it was first reported and has kind of spread around there a bit. Okay, so here's a pea field. Um, I see this area kind of in the low spot that uh, doesn't look quite as good. What is it? Again, we really need to go out and look. Um, with peas, it's sometimes a little more obvious what it is, um, especially if it's in a low spot, it's probably root rot. One of the biggest issues we have in peas is fusarium root rot. Fusarium is the most commonly occurring soil-borne fungus that causes root rot in peas. And uh, this is some examples of symptoms of fusarium root rot. This is pretty severe. The second thing we look for is mycosphorella blight. It can either uh, be present in the upper canopy or we can get ascochyta foot rot that occurs down uh, near the base of the stem. This is the second most commonly occurring disease. Um, management, uh, this last one is bacterial blight on peas. 
And so sometimes we see these water soaking type lesions uh, and, and when they dry out, they just give this kind of necrotic uh, lesion appearance. Um, I'm not gonna go into talking about management right now, just in the interest of time, but if there are questions, uh, I'll be certainly happy to, to address them. So I guess as far as a new kid on the block in peas, it's not really new. I'm sure everyone's heard of a phantomyces root rot, but it's relatively new compared to fusarium. Fusarium's always been an issue in peas since we started growing them here. The phantomyces was first reported um, about six years ago, I think, six or seven years ago, or confirmed for the first time in Alberta uh, about six years ago. So here's an example of a healthy root system, and then this is the phantomyces infected root system, and you can see that it kind of has a more uh, tan or honey brown color associated with it. And as this progresses, you get root pruning and eventually there'll be no lateral or feeder roots left. The root system will just essentially break down and the plant will collapse above ground. And, and so while we don't have as many fields with the phantomyces, this, this pathogen is really aggressive and can be very, very severe. Okay, last one, cereals. There's no disease in this picture because I didn't have a field scale photo of a, a serial disease, but uh, here's some symptoms of fusarium head blight in wheat, stripe rust in wheat, serial leaf spots caused by fungi like septoria stagonospora and tan spot, tan spot pathogen, and then root rots. So here's the seed, here's the subcrown internode, and then here's the uh, crown roots. When this subcrown internode gets attacked by an organism like Fusarium or Rhizoctonia or the take all fungus and chokes this off, um, it can have uh, pretty serious effects above ground. And so um, these would be some of the root rot symptoms you'd want to look for is, the, is discoloration on this subcrown internode. And the length of this is going to depend on how deep the crop was seeded in the ground. Um, so these are commonly occurring. We've already talked about fusarium head blight. You guys aren't really in an area where stripe rust shows up um, at, at levels like they do um, kind of in um, Cardston County or Lethbridge County or 40 Mile in the south. Sometimes we can see um, very little stripe rust and then three days later, it's almost too late to spray for it. It can be really rapid and catastrophic. Um, we don't see that in stellar, but it is still something to watch for. And if you're growing a variety that doesn't have resistance to stripe rust, you may need to apply a fungicide to prevent yield loss. Um, fungal leaf spots, these are common and everybody knows about these. What about the new guys? <clears throat> Uh, about three years ago, we started picking up um, some fields with wheat streak mosaic virus. This is a field um, in, I think, in the Warner area that you can see early in the season basically just uh, died because of the uh, wheat streak mosaic. So this, this field was um, worked and reseeded uh, in June to a, a short season crop. So this can be a real serious problem, something to be on the lookout for. And then finally, this is something that we saw a lot of last year, bacterial leaf streak in wheat and barley. And it causes these longitudinal lesions. Sometimes you'll get bacterial ooze droplets forming on the surface of the lesion. And it, the bacteria can splash up and cause a gloom blotch on the head as well. Um, there's a, this has become a real important problem here in, on the, the, the Canadian prairies here just in the last few years. And um, this can easily be misdiagnosed as either stripe rust or just uh, a fungal leaf spot. And so it's important to keep an eye out for these longitudinal lesions and then get a diagnosis. Um, especially if you're keeping grain to use for seed, because the pathogen on these blooms will get into the, the grain. And uh, if you're using it for seed, you could end up just escalating the problem the subsequent year um, by a large amount. So th this is an important one to keep an eye out for. Okay, that's the end of my uh, presentation. Uh, I'm gonna turn the controls back over. 
And thanks for your attention and um, appreciate the opportunity to talk to you today. And thanks again to Quentin for all the help with uh, crop surveys. It's, it's really an important part of our network. Well, thank you, Mike, for your presentation. I'm just going to ask our board if they have any more questions. Uh, we have a question from um, Mr. Gender. Michael, I'm just kind of wondering, with all this data that we have, okay, with the China, it was more of a political view that they looked at with the canola. Could something like this, with all the information that we are sending or open to them, could it, could it backfire on us? Could they use it against us, say, like in nine? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, I, I'm probably not the best person to answer that. Um, as, a, as a plant pathologist, getting into the political ramifications of sharing data is a little, makes me a little nervous. Um, I, I think probably anytime we share information about pests, we do have to be careful. Um, and so uh, I can understand why that question would come to mind. I think though, in general, um, and I think we saw this with the BSE crisis, having good assurance systems and being transparent is really the way that I've seen to effectively reopen or re-engage with trade partners. I think if we try and be secretive and not share information, then there's um, I, I, there's other challenges that come with that. So uh, could there be problems with sharing some of this information? Um, I don't know. Sorry, I, I'm, I'm just not sure about that. Well, the main reason I brought that up is so like Mr. Nyberg had brought up, okay, with the uh, canola, we are not taking any fields off. So they could look at this and say, okay, before long, all of our fields are going to be contaminated. Just, just yeah, to them, Michael. Yeah, that, that's a that's an important point. I, on the clubroot side, China has clubroot, and 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 um, they they've admitted that they have it. So, moving clubroot to China wouldn't be um, a trade issue. But I understand the point you're making, and I think it is important an important one. Um, so the the one of the pests that they that I know that China had um, indicated we had was bacterial pod spot on canola. Now we've never picked that up in any of our survey work, and so we did some targeted focus surveys for bacterial pod spot to kind of put that issue to bed. Um, and, and I think that's lots of times how how the information is used. We don't we don't gather all of our pest information and then just send it all um, to China. It's it's more focused, I think, to help resolve these issues. And and, and I think the point you make is important to think about. But um, it's folks like the chief provincial plant health officer, the minister, and the CFIA that are going to be making those decisions about what information to share. Okay, thank you. I have one question as well. With these uh, new diseases that you just brought to our attention, with the fungicides the uh, producers are using to be treating similar diseases already, would those same fungicides work on these new diseases? Well, that's an excellent management question. Um, so in some cases, yes, but in most cases, no. So the, I'll, I'll give you three examples. Um, with aphanomyces, because it's a root rot pathogen, we just really don't have good management tools. The C treatments can help hold the disease off for a couple, three weeks. But after that, the C treatment wears off. And, and so we don't have any good management tools for aphanomyces. Um, for verticillium stripe, if you were applying a fungicide at black leg timing, so early, very early applications of fungicide for management of black leg, you could potentially get, um, and, and, and I'm speculating here, I don't have any uh, information to back this up, but I'm speculating that some of those fungicides may help prevent black or verticillium infections in canola. But I would say spraying at uh, sclerotinia timing at flowering probably would not prevent verticillium stripe. And then the last one is bacterial leaf streak in wheat. And because it's a bacterial pathogen, the fungicides are not effective. So in that case, no. Okay, great, thank you. 
Uh, were there any other questions? Um, Jury, um, do you have any questions from your um, your end? No, I don't. Okay. Okay, with that, we will um, thank you very much, uh, Michael, for your presentation. We appreciated you uh, zooming in today with that. It's good information. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think you don't need me to stick around. Is it okay if I sign out? Um, sure, that should be fine. Yeah. We'll just continue on with our meeting, but we did appreciate you uh, being part of our meeting today. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, uh, we'll move on to our agenda. Um, 5.1, the reports. Uh, uh, I guess briefly here, beaver dam removal has been a little slow this year. Removed three. We have one more to do. Um, just waiting on some parts for my truck, actually. Um, back in Gadsby with uh, Municipal Services and Plan Development working on a chicken issue. Received a lot of calls on sick trees and shrubs this year. Um, most of them are winter related, the lack of snow, no insulation on the tree, it was really hard on trees. Uh, frost damage in the spring, since we had such a cool spring, uh, things were leaving out before frost was done, so we had quite a few calls and, and comments on frost and black leaves, thinking they were sprayed, but it's just frost damage. Uh, received quite a few calls on coyotes in one of our hamlets, scenic sands. Um, pardon? Uh, so is it a large coyote or a large coyote problem? Because the way that it came across was large coyote problem. I'm thinking you got a whole bunch of coyotes. But in this case, you only have one large coyote. <laughs> it's uh, with, birth, with further investigation with fish and wildlife, it seems like it's one large coyote. Mm -hmm. okay. so all of where the apostrophe or the comma puts in, right? <laughs> um, so yeah, that was that was it. Um, special permits are, are required for that one because I can only do coyote calls if there's predation on livestock. Fish and wildlife does not do calls on coyote. But if there is an instance where something needs to be removed in this, this kind of situation, they can issue me a special permit. I just have to go to Edmonton to get it. Fish and Wildlife helped me out. They went out and walked around with a few of the rape bears, and the problem went away. Nobody shot anything yet. Um, May 17, we started up spraying brush sites from uh, Public Works. Um, Brushing operations. Our tank loaders took longer to turn on this year than normal because we had a lot of vandalism. Doors being broke open, pipes being busted, damage to boxes. Uh, seeding, both the drainage projects been seeded. We're just waiting for some good grass growth so we can do some weed control. And we had some tree bug issues early on. Go for control in Boston and Gatsby Ball Diamonds. Okay. That aphid control on the spruce trees. What what do you do to control that? Or do you? Or what what would you tell somebody to? Um, early on, I would suggest using uh, cold well water, like between four and seven degrees cold water, and you soak your tree down like a torrential downpour and the cold shocks the aphids, drops them to the ground and as you soak your tree from top to bottom, all the aphids come to the bottom and then you soak your grass and ground. If that doesn't work, you can use an insecticidal soap or a malathion and respray your trees. Interesting. Uh, so less the issue if it was a wet year? Yeah. Okay. Uh, both in the greenhouses and outdoors, aphids were a a big hit this spring. Um, and their natural predator is the ladybug? Ladybird beetle. Ladybug. So the house I did, is on fire, so that must be what it is. 
I did refrain from suggesting Malathion because that does take care of your ladybugs as well. Insecticidal soap doesn't affect ladybug, nor does cold water. It'll wash them out of the tree, but they'll be fine. They fly away. So, um, in the areas where there was a lot of aphids, this fall, next spring, you will find a pile of ladybugs. Cool. They kind of cycle each other. I have a question. No, aphids uh, will they go through a cycle and then maybe we'll get our leaves back on our maple trees or not? You notice your maple your maple trees are down with yeah no. mine too. I I just thought my trees were old. No, you, you'll find like they'll cycle. Um, it all depends on the maturity of your tree. If it's a bigger tree, it'll be fine. Next year it'll come back. Like you you'll never know you have a problem with aphids, and the ladybugs will be there helping them. If it's a younger tree, it could stunt its growth a bit depending on how severe the damage was before. You did any kind of treatment or they did run away. Same aphid? Aphid, well, or are they a different brand of aphid? That's there are different aphids. The aphids that went after your flowers, the ones your wife planted in the pots, will be the ones going after your maple trees, your poplar trees. The ones that are in your spruce trees are different, but the same method affects both. Um, Bridger placement projects. We are currently seeding up a storm on those from last year's big bridge replacements. Uh, and then we've seeded, I guess you call it two plots in the old yard here. East of the drainage ditch, what I would call the museum piece is done. And then we, we did right here from this gate, kind of up and around the corner, this piece has also been seeded. So hopefully we start to see some, some green growth on that. Uh, water pump, magpie, cattle scales, or cattle scale, uh, rentals are going out. Um, not so much on skunk traps, I'm getting calls on skunks, but nobody's getting a trap. And uh, booked four prevalent spray jobs, weather dependent. One's completed, however the timing wasn't the best. We've got to redo some spots because rain hit shortly after. And with COVID, um, with the restrictions on COVID lightning a bit, we are getting back into some webinars and workshops. So I'm working with Toso Bozik, and we're going to do a 10-day, um, or a 10-week, sorry, webinar. Every other week or so, we'll, we'll do a, an hour, hour and a half webinar on pruning your trees, proper shelter belt maintenance, planning for next year's shelter belt, diseases you want to stay away from, types of trees for your air, those sorts of things. And, and uh, with that, if restrictions continue the way, or yeah, restrictions continue the way they're going and lighten up, we are planning a, a bit of a tour later on. So that's kind of exciting. Can you send that, uh, that webinar invite to all of the- As soon as we have the dates all secured, absolutely, we'll be advertising like crazy. Sounds good. And then, uh, yeah, some pictures for you guys. Beaver dam removal. Sorry, no sound. Um, you removed the beavers too? Nope. No beavers were injured in this <laughs> from our doing. Uh, the right pair had someone lined up to do some damage control. This is our new truck we put together last year. This is our brush truck. All it is is a tank with a handgun, and it's it's getting into the nooks and crannies where the spray trucks can't go, or brush control. How long is the hose? 100 feet. Um, with the with the option to add on 100 foot chunks. I was just gonna say, did the guys find that or gals find that it's enough? Like is so far, feet enough? so far 100 feet is 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 good because the truck can go down in the ditch too. So. 100 feet, you get 100 feet off the school and you're dressed like the next picture, that's a lot of work. I was just going to say, 200 yeah. feet's a lot of pull, you need a second person helping. I'm not so sure, I'll be honest, if I saw 
If I saw that guy pull into my ditch beside my house, I'm not so sure I'd be uh, alrighty then. <laughs> CDC, put, we should put CDC. <laughs> County destruction. Getting rid of COVID. Yeah. Yeah. So on the next picture, I was just curious, what did ASB have to do with the chicken issue? Uh, because I have stray animal and that, so yeah, it was a combined effort. Yeah, that, that complaint came in indicating that there were livestock at large, large. Um, as well as uh, deceased livestock and, and eggs. Uh, and others. And others, so it was, it was described fairly severely. So we sent a, a large, um, a large team. We sent out three of us the planning and development for the, the, the chicken keeping in a hamlet. Myself representing protective services. They were all in training, and uh, Quentin came for the stray animals and identification. Um, so yeah, uh, it ended up being a fairly small issue. There were a couple of eggs that a predator seemed to have been able to take from one of the neighboring properties. Um, and, and there was, um, yeah, one got interrupted in process clearly as, as it had not been cleaned out by the predator, but it wasn't as bad as the complaint had come in and we were happy that that kind of scene that was described was not uh, picture. Yeah. Um, just then you report, I see where you would uh, control gophers on ball diamonds. Um, I don't know, it's probably really your department, but I, I did receive one call about gophers in the, the landfill transfer station running like everywhere. So, I can let waste management know. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, and they'll ask you to fix it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, probably. Anyway. So, where are you, you on the ball diamond? What are you using? I'm using a product called Rolcon. It's basically bubble bath with mustard in it. Um, and a special nozzle, so when you're pumping it through a hose, there's a special aeration nozzle that basically it's like putting bubble bath through your jet tub. And it foams up like crazy, and what it does is occupy the airspace. It's like using a large tank of water and flooding the gophers and drowning them. You're drowning them with 100 liters of water doing entire ball field instead of 1500 liter or 1500 gallons don't ever apply for a gophernator because i wouldn't give you one not on a ball time not after uh city of airdrie yeah no <laughs> <laughs> you saw that video yeah. <laughs> oops okay nothing like five acres of parkway being on fire yeah. <laughs> are there any other questions for quentin's report not that I have a mover for the report. Uh, Mr. Nyberg, all in favor? Kerry, or oh, sorry, Cherie, did you have any questions? No, I don't. Thank you. I, I'm in favor. Okay. Great. Thank you. I was just going to add on page nine, you see some spruce aphid damage on some mature spruce. Andrew wasn't done scrolling through. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, okay. Uh, so, so the difference between your aphids attacking your poplar maple flowers that will the flowers will come back next year if they're annuals but your trees will come back next year spruce trees won't what about pine so, like are they part of the same aphid group coniferous is the biggest thing your coniferous trees once you get damaged like you see on the top of the second picture where the needles are are falling off you'll see some regrowth on those branches on next year's buds but you're not going to see a full branch again for in that tree's lifetime. It's it's already too old. Um, but so with the pine trees, they um, is the aphid attack them too, or they, are they just a different a spruce aphid and spruce gull will attack the spruce trees and cause this damage? But is there a, is there a pine aphid? It's the same. It's called a spruce aphid. It'll go after pine. It'll go after fir. And then the next pictures down is frost damage. These are Japanese lilacs. And you can see the black uh, tips of the leaves. It's a little shadowy, but. That's fairly minor compared to the insect damages, I think. But... Yeah. There you go. There we go.
So yeah, in the top picture, you can kind of see it um, above what looks like a, the fence there. You can see some black leaves curled up. And you can see how people are commenting that it may be herbicide damage because it does have a cupping look to it. And the first thing that herbicide does to leaves is give them a cup or in, in, in broad leaves, it'll give them a twist. And you can see that, but because the entire leaf wasn't cupped or black, it's just the tip, it's a sign of frost. And because there's new growth with it, that tree is going to be fine. Those black leaves will be there till the wind blows them off. They're a dead leaf. Now they're going to fall like it was November. The tree will be fine. The next one's there. That's the seeding. That's actually in the next in the yard behind us. Our new to us brilliant cedar. It's working good. Yes. Very well. Yep. Yeah. Then there's some moisture maps at the bottom to finish off. And then like the council package, I included our uh, our work plan for the next, for, well, for May and June. It's a big document, so I'm just giving you a little bit at a time, plan and, and completed. And 18 and a half cases of strychnine were sold in May and June. So we're at 148 cases sold in 2021. I have 132 and three quarters cases left in inventory for the next month and a bit, and then for sales up until March 4 of next year. We will be out of them. Pardon? We will be out of them. Oh. Yeah. We're way up on sales. Annually, we sell 80 cases. I'm at 100, 148. And I can't see anybody stocking more than they need. Um, I should have looked it up, but I don't think, I think I've had one repeat customer so far. That's good. Everybody's getting there a little bit, which is kind of what we wanted. Ordered any one spot, it's all distributed. Well, there, I know you approved the report, that's the rest of it. I'm going to do those things on that one. Um, so, with the last bit of information Quentin has shared, is there any further questions? Okay, no one. We have got an approval of that report, so that's good. Um, thank you, Quentin. And move on now to uh, 6.1, uh, correspondence on the red tape reduction, uh, Mr. Gender. Last uh, month, I did a letter that was a request to be sent out with regarding to make the reclamation of pits. I saw that there was a check sent out to the landowner on there for it. I'm just kind of wondering. Hello. Come on. There you go. Okay. So I'm just kind of wondering like, whether we've heard anything back from any, any response. So I don't actually think the letter's been sent yet. Nikki and I have been kind of busy. She had her county connection link. That's next on the list to get completed. That will be sent out. Thank you. Great. Can I keep the what name? No, I'm sure. Could you repeat that? I, I just was just sitting and I could not hear what Ernie was saying. Basically, Ernie was asking, uh, last month we requested a, a letter be sent regarding uh, gravel pit reclamation to the government in red tape correspondence, red tape reduction correspondence, and Quentin has uh, replied that that letter is still to go. Thank you. Okay, so any further discussion on that? Okay, I guess we can... Move on to 7.2, future ASB growth. Okay, so you guys, uh, well, sorry, council, I guess, has uh, decided to increase taxes a little bit and put some money into ASB. 
works out to 36,000 in chain, if I'm not mistaken, going into uh, reserves for future use. So I'm looking for some input and ideas on how you guys think we should grow ASB. I've got some ideas myself. Um, always more equipment on the ground is great. With more equipment comes more staff. Um, but uh, we're kind of getting things back on, on track with COVID going up. We're getting back into our workshops. We're, we're, we're spraying with what we have for roadside. We've got our private land sprayer doing our gravel pits. We've got private land jobs. We've got hamlets we need to look after as far as parks, alleyways, that sort of thing. We've recently almost concluded talks with Clean Farms to become a, um, I guess a depot is the best word for egg plastic recycling for the bales they'll come pick up at our, our yard south of town. We're getting bale twine bags so that you can take a bag home and put all your bale twine in it. I take it back, Clean Farm picks it up. Those things are kind of pushing forward. Um, looking for some ideas where we do and don't want to go. We brought up um, the Alias program a few times and looking at some of our neighbors, that's not where we want to go. Do we want to look into um, land use like Clearwater? They've got a land use coordinator that basically it's like your own Ducks Unlimited but with your rules set in place and, and you're helping with conservation conservation on a, on a different scope, egg related instead of wildlife related. Maybe we want to look at something like that. I don't know what you guys, what you're thinking. So let me start the conversations and then bring back some ideas. So this is a, um, a, um, a trap that most organizations get into. We do a do strat plan and then when we have this conversation, the strat plan's not been brought up. I think that should be our starting point. Let's look back at the strat plan that we have developed for the Egg Service Board, bring it out, throw it on the table for the next meeting and, and have a little bit of an opportunity for us to, to work through it because we did spend the better part of a day going through that and trying to organize a strat plan in connection with the county's strategic planning. So, and I think that should be our first step to look back at it. We all get this, the, the narrow focus, but when you're in strat planning, you're supposed to take the blinders off and look a little bit out further and maybe a little bit east and west from your, your narrow vision. So I think that's the opportunity to bring this off the shelf, give it a dusting off, look at it and see what we were discussing. Did we do that three years ago? Or I think we had it in January, actually. That was the mini one, but yeah, for sure. So I think we need to, that's that's the starting point. And that'd be, I could offer that, Mr. Chair. No, that's a good idea, and it, it'd be a good opportunity for you to introduce in the new ideas you have to see um, how many of them are sort of mentioned in the strat plan already, and how many we could look at inter or adding to a strat plan. Yeah. Uh, any further comments, Mr. Gender? I think that like this thirty-seven thousand was that related to the. <laughs> uh, 38,000, is that related to the 2% increase in farm taxes? Yes. It was put towards agriculture, but it has not really been defined where. I find a lot of times, like when the taxes are coming on that, it could also mm -hmm. be, are we, do we maybe require more on to say like the roadside for accommodation, whether it's going to be gravel or anything like that. So it's. I'm not going to say it's going to be just definitely narrowed down to as for the expenditure there, but I would like to be able to see it being very broad. Where do we really need these funds going? I could speak a little to that. Um, there was a, a similar uh, tax increase a few years ago where a portion of the mill was added to, to farmland. Um, and uh, those were earmarked at that time. What a portion of it was marked towards road specifically uh, for to, to recognize the road use uh, that farmers require as well as bridges. Uh, so I think uh, um, 
I, I thought I had understood from the intent of council was was to funnel it more directly to ag rather than all things that benefit farmers. Um, so I think that's why it's being brought back here to to scope it. That was my understanding, and mine as well. And it was mine as well that this increase would be um, channeled towards improvements in the egg service. Whether it was for rental equipment or we talked a number of reasons what we could put it towards. A lot of different things that helped agriculture. And I mean, down the road, there no doubt will be, there'll have to be future uh, tax increases, no doubt. And and at that time, I think they can be uh, earmarked for projects that would help farmers you know, on the roadside and things. I, I understood that it was directly to be set up for Quinton to set up a sheep extension program is what I understood it, but I, I could be wrong. I, I don't know. I missed that memo. Or chickens. Yeah, sheep or chickens. I'm not sure which one. Too soon? I have a hard time roping chickens, but I can rope a sheep. Like that. Mr. Chairman, you have the... Oh, I'm sorry. Adam um, Zero Cassidy. Thank you. So when we put the mill on, I think it was all tax classes at that time, and then we, we split it between gravel and roads. It's actually built up to be a pretty good nest egg. And we were able to do those huge bridge programs with it last year. I mean, it's great to have some extra money in egg, and I think we can enhance our services, and I think we started that with the rental equipment. But, you know, we don't have to spend it all at once. We can't let it build up and, and uh, you know, we could we could see some droughts, uh, you know, excessive moisture. Here's wishing, <laughs> um, you know, and go forward that way too. But that's why we should talk about the strat plan to see what our our strategic planning was to set out and look at. Good point as well. Okay, so um, Mr. Chairman, I'll receive for information with the idea that Mr. Uh, Quinton Beaumont will bring back the strap plan for next meeting to have that discussion. Okay. Okay. That works. Yeah. In favor of that motion? You may have to send that strap plan out again. I'm not sure I know how to find it. It's got dusty. Okay. And uh, Sheree, are you in favor? Yep, I'm in favor. Okay. All, uh, that motion is carried then. Okay, moving on uh, 8.1. Was there any correspondence? Uh, 9.1, the finances. Okay. Finances are not part of the package. You guys do receive them in your council package. I do have them up if there's any questions on uh, anything, I guess. Um, right now, our sale on strict nine is 120% of what we budgeted. Obviously, we're selling more than we have planned. Um, then plots, demos, and extension were 113% expended on that one. However, I caught a uh, one line that was put into wrong GL, so that will actually put it back to 87, 89%. Uh, strict nine sales were 103% sold. The price of strict nine on our last sales was up a little bit to put us over the budget amount. So I was over $1,200. Nothing else is over 100%. Everything else looks hard. If you have any questions, I can answer them. Okay. So I guess a uh, question to administration then, will, like the financial report, will they appear in the future ASB meetings, near to dates and stuff, or is that not appropriate in this meeting? You don't include it in MPC packages or um, any other committees. Except maybe the rec board gets a or yeah, gets a report from um, Lorraine. Yeah. So if anything monetary would be a council decision, so I would kind of like to keep it in the council yeah. package. Just um, trying to streamline a few things, right? So finance doesn't have to produce this for two meetings, just one. one. Okay, no, I follow that. Now, we used to do it the other way, but I just want to the reasoning behind that. That makes sense. Okay. And, um, so do we even need finance on our agendas anymore? No, so. We just wanted to do this to make sure, and then it's going to get removed. Okay. I will be removed from it. Okay. 
And were there any information items you wish to share? Nothing has been sent my way. Uh, I shouldn't say that. I just received some stuff on Stop Dead, our Dutch Elm disease stuff, so I'll include that in the next meeting package. Okay. It missed the the making of the package, the cutoff for this one. Okay. So then we'll move on to 11.1, um, the uh, provincial ASB report that Wayne has uh, sent into the package on page 18. Are there any questions on that one? Chairman, I have none. Okay. Receive for information. Okay, Mr. Nyberg has moved to receive that report for information. All in favor? Just I'm in comment. favor. Just a comment. There's lots of. Uh, looks like you guys are doing lots of work, Wayne. You're getting lots of. Yeah, no, it's, it's a really good committee. It's, uh, we get to talk to the deputy ministers, the ministers, and we even have a. We even get uh, this in July. We're meeting with Jason Nixon, who it's hard to get a. You don't like people. The meeting with, yeah. So, you know, oh, are you uh, going to bring up our gravel pit situation? You know, I think I'm going to ask if I can slip that in. Okay. Yeah. We're not alone. Yeah. And at our, uh, I guess, I get, if I can move into. Okay, um, should we do the um, all in favor of your motion, or do you? Yeah, want yeah, we'll do that. Okay, all in favor of James' motion to receive. I think the report? I think we're I did. Okay. Carry that one's carried then. And then now we'll move on to 11.2 uh, oral presentation on ag plastics by Wayne. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, we, we had a uh, ag plastics uh, recycling group meeting, uh, Zoom meeting here the other day, and uh, there was some excellent presentations in there. One of them that was uh, uh, from a group that looks at uh, bioplastic and it's degradable plastic so uh, you know and, and it can be mixed with other other plastics as well it's a research it's a research program that's carried on out of the University of Ed Edmonton ag, ag and forestry and uh, you know it's does have some potential I guess especially when you're going to single use plastics and things like that just to uh, to have something that will biodegrade so and they said they can mix mixed with other plastics too. So it's, yeah, it's an interesting concept. Okay. And uh, so are the biodegradables made from uh, oil products? Well, it's made for some of the things that they use. I've got a few things uh, written down here, if I can find it. Um, pea starch, hemp. Yeah. Canola and wheat straw, sugar beets. Some of the things that some of the raw materials they use to uh, create plastic work with that. So, uh, so there's nineteen million dollars going to be set aside for the government for single-use plastic, and so some of this uh, they're hoping to channel some of this money into some of the research. So, yeah, just a inter interesting. Is that federal or provincial money? Uh, I think it's federal. Uh, that should be uh, another agricultural opportunity too if they're using those agricultural products. Plastics is a thirty billion dollar a year um, investment, I guess. Is that just in Alberta or where is that seems like? No, that, that's uh, well, I don't know. I I I, I didn't write that down, and of course that's a week ago, so I don't remember. Thirty billion, I would think. I mean, everything we do is plastics. I mean. Our so, so maybe that is just I I can't say it sounds a little high for just uh, Alberta. So I I wouldn't I don't know if I would. There's a lot of stuff. But I'll certainly uh, I'll certainly check that out. And uh, Clean Farms actually gave a presentation. I think I I, I sent that presentation in just uh, last month. The their uh, up their year to date presentation and. Uh, but they've got a kind of a neat thing, and I don't know whether it was part of this or or not, uh, but it was, uh, they've got some, uh, they're doing some research on bale wrap and silage wrap, which is kind of 
because it's it's not necessarily a clean uh, plastic. And so they've devised a bit of a press that they manufactured in southern Alberta someplace, and it's uh, they made it out of grill stem and some um, recycled plastic uh, planks for the sides. And they fold the plastic. I think they take it 16 foot strips and fold it over. Uh, so they they've got about a uh, four by four by um, basically a four by four sheet of plastic when it's folded up. And they put it in this press and they compress it until these uh, little bales weigh about 560 pounds roughly. And so then they it makes it. Then the trucks, when the trucks come in, it makes it worthwhile for them to haul away. So it's, uh, and they've, they've sent a sample of this to uh, the Bashaw plastic plant and they sent it uh, to the States and they haven't had any results on it yet, whether, this is, whether they can use it or not. But they said, by the time you pull this up and move it around a little bit, most of the, the contamination shakes loose. So said it, he figures it's gonna be, Pretty acceptable plastic, and the twines, the Zalus twine, they're they big uh, client or customer or source of raw material is the hay plants, and so they've got their bags at these hay plants that they where they collect, and so that's uh, the big source. Some of the most of the other feeders use brown bales or things like that, but the hay plants where they compress the hay and rebale it to ship yeah, those days, yeah. yeah. Okay. So there's a lot of twine there, so. I would imagine they just look at that one on Highway 2, how many bales they go. So one of the things that uh, I've I brought forward from our, our provincial committee was uh, the pesticide container, the program. And some municipalities have had to upgrade the pesticide container program or the sites at their own dime, at their own cost. And so it's kind of a double dipping because it's uh, it's supposed to be paid for by the people who the, the people who produce the chemicals, sprays, and things like that. And uh, and if they didn't meet up to standard, then they had to they had to upgrade them at the cost of the municipality. So, and it was a resolution, pesticide container resolution at their last, I don't know if it was the last or the, the one before um, conference. But uh, we sent a letter out to try and get a response. <laughs> Nobody wanted to accept a letter. Nobody wanted to accept responsibility. So Clean Farms is actually looking into this. They want to, it is a wish of the municipalities that brought the uh, resolution forward that it be handled more like the other provinces. And Clean Farms looks after it, after the collection, and it's uh, funded by the people of the chemical producers. And this is mostly the small containers, mm -hmm. okay. like the site out of the landfill there, things like that. So, mm -hmm. so do we get any assistance at this time to maintain those sites? Uh, who paid for the upgrades of the... They all do one. Pardon? They all do one. Uh, They'll do it once. Oh, okay. it, do it once or, or make it uh, ready once. And that's that's their policy. The, uh, uh, Mr. Nixon's department, environment. Yeah, they'll apparently do a one-time upgrade. But after that, apparently the municipalities are on their own. That's what I understand. So that was that was the what the resolution was about to put to put the responsibility back on the chemical uh, producers. So that was a, and that's going to be an ongoing conversation. Yeah, yeah. Egg plastics is a is a big uh, big uh, item of discussion. You know, the, uh, the resolution read, therefore, be resolved that the AP developed with Clean Farms an empty pesticide container program that places the responsibility of collecting pesticide containers in Alberta with the ag retailers 
ag retailers slash dealers and removes responsibility from the municipalities. So uh, some municipalities still had to accept the responsibility. So that was uh, it was about and it, and it was kind of a, uh, something that I saw in the uh, actually Lori pointed out with me on on Facebook. Uh, to do with the ag uh, recycling place in Bashaw, there's a couple of young guys. I think since the are independents, uh, there's a, they're doing a project that makes furniture or whatever out of the recycled plastic. So it, it is something uh, quite positive. I'm just going to send this to you if I can figure out how to do it, uh, Andrew, and maybe put it on the screen. It's, it's limited. That's how much uh, they can do with the recycled product. Yeah. So I guess there's a write up in the center independent, the last one, and I didn't. Uh, Get that so I, but yeah, I thought it was a kind of a, a local thing and a kind of a neat idea and something that's not too far from home, really. So those look like planters and things, and um. Well, that's a, that was my report, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you. Uh, any questions for Wayne's oral report on egg plastics? Cherie, did you have anything to ask? I already have a hard time on mute. No, I didn't. Thank you, Wayne. Okay. Uh, would someone move to receive that report? Uh, I'll move. Okay, just one second, Sri. I guess Ernie has a question. Did they make these right at Bashaw? Apparently, yeah. Uh, the, you know, I I just kind of glanced through the write up under this, but it's it's in the stepper last. I guess it must be the last stepper independent. So, like when I've driven by there, it looked like they were taking all the one old pipeline yard. So I don't know whether they were just collecting it or whether they what was really happening. They've done both. They've got the plant on the east side and then the A and B uh, Burgess plant or yard downtown with this building they've got as well. And they've been, you know, recycling it, pelleting it and shipping it wherever they ship their plastic beads to. So. Yeah, I can see that product actually finding a use. I guess a lot of people do that uh, container gardening and whatever. Yeah, so that's a little, I thought it was kind of neat to have business that close to home mm -hmm. and we wondered about recycling um, what we can do you know where some of our local plastic might go it's nice to see these young young minds that work uh, could be young entrepreneurs actually making a business out of this that's great okay if there's no further questions Sheree, let's move to receive this report for information all those in favor Carrie. i'm in favor Okay, uh, 12 on our, point 12 on our agenda is the next meeting will be July 28th. 11.3. Nope. Didn't catch 11.3. Yeah, just have 11 down there, so I'm just okay. No, I, I oh, didn't. I think we moved it to 6.5, that's right. So next meeting, July 28th, it's going to be, we'll be meeting again, and then I'll give you a motion to adjourn. Well, we've got 13.1. <laughs> well, I thought we already talked about that in its report. We did mention it. Is there anything else you'd like to add? I don't think so. That's just kind of a Cole's nose version of what this MD spread over a while is going to look like. It's like basically same time, same date of the week each 10 weeks or yeah, that's so the idea is kind of maybe every other tuesday evening or something or yeah. or 
you know, the second Tuesday of the month, we'll do it at three in the afternoon, and the fourth Tuesday of the month, it'll be at seven at night. The times I got to work out with Toso, but it'll be once we set it up, that's what it will be, and you can choose to click on and 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 watch it live, or it's going to get recorded, and then the webinar will be. You can go back and, and watch it on our website at a later time if you want. Okay. That's what I was wondering if they were going to right. They could repeat, or but if they're recorded, then they can be caught at any time. And I think we're good to keep it for three months afterwards. I think is what it is. Right. Well, that'd be good because some of them will interest you, but you might miss the, the timing. Yeah. Okay, that's good. Hopefully, we get a bigger audience doing it like that. I don't know if we can measure is the wrong word, but measure how many people view that webinar mm -hmm. after hour or after during the webinar and then afterwards on our site, because it would be good to see if maybe it's the way to go versus a, a live workshop, you know, where we average. I think, people. yeah, it can be recorded how many people view it, because I, the uh, library offered a gardening one this spring, and it had like 843 oh. people took part in it, which I thought was quite a large number. Okay, I mean, we discussed this. I'm just going to ask for someone to receive uh, 13.1 for information. Um, Wayne moves that we receive that for information. Sheree in favor? Yes. All in favor and carry. Was there any in camera items? No. No, I'll give you that. Mr. Nyberg moves to adjourn. All in favor? In favor. Sheree, carried. Yes, let's wrap that up at 1122. So I guess we have a little free time. Does administration need our ear 